much for having me here today. Um, I have a little competition for my diaphragm as a baby that's due in February, so uh, still kind of getting accustomed to speaking uh, with a baby on board. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, the research in vitamin C in the nest, um, to tell you a little bit about how it started, where we are now, and, and where it's going. And uh, I'm happy to take questions during the talk or afterwards, whatever seems best for all of you. So again, for the talk today, I have a few things that I'd really like to accomplish. First of all, to sort of get you up to speed if you don't know about how vitamin D was initially linked with MS. Next, to talk about whether vitamin D matters once you already have the diagnosis or if it's sort of too late to do anything about. And then also to talk a little bit about the clinical trial that we're doing now, sponsored by the National MS Society to see if supplementation with vitamin D actually helps the course of MS. So when people come to my clinic and they're diagnosed with MS, they say, well, how did this happen? And I say, you know, there are some factors that you're born with, your genetic factors, and there are some factors in the environment, and they kind of come together and cause this disease in some way, shape, or form. And we think it's an autoimmune disease, and we're still kind of trying to piece it together. It turns out, I mean, we know some interesting things about both the genetic factors as well as the environmental factors. So the genes are the things you're born with, and uh, we know that MS is more common if you have a family history of the disease, but it's not a really perfect story. So if I were a person with MS and I had an identical twin, her risk of getting the disease would only be about 30%. So we share, we would share 100% of our genes, but she only had a 30% chance of getting MS. So that's not a really tight, tight genetic um, link. And while each year it seems we have a new uh, set of genes that are associated with MS risk, each gene itself, each little change in the gene, um, is associated only with a really incremental increase in the risk of MS. So that doesn't really explain the whole picture. The other reason we know that to be true is that over the past several decades, MS seems to be increasing, both in the US as well as in several countries around the world. And that's happening at a rate that's too fast to be explained by genetics. Also, the risk of MS seems to be increasing more in women at this time than in men. So the ratio of women to men affected by MS is really climbing and climbing in many studies. So that, again, points to something environmental rather than a pure genetic cause or problem that's on the rise. What are the environmental factors that we already know about um, that have been associated with MS? There have been many viruses associated with the disease, uh, or people thought that might be associated with the disease, and mostly they've been debunked. I remember when I was in college, I was doing a, a report on MS, and there were just like 30, 40 viruses that were listed as potentially associated with the disease. So it gets a little confusing. The one that seems to be most uh, convincingly linked with MS is Epstein-Barr virus. That's a virus that actually most of us get at some point in our lives, um, so that it may be something about when in your life you get Epstein-Barr infection, or something about the way Epstein-Barr interacts with your genetics that actually induces MS. Uh, there have been studies showing that MS patients are more likely to have noticed the Epstein-Barr infection. It's the infection that causes mono. So they'd say, ask people with and without MS, hey, did you ever have mono? MS patients are more likely to say, oh yeah, I had a terrible case of mono. Um, so that is sort of one area of active research. And People have talked about, but I think it's still far, far away, you know, what if we did a vaccine against vaccine bar virus, would that help prevent that? So I think that's sort of off in the future, but something that could be interesting. Cigarette smoking, definitely a known risk factor for MS. Um, that's been shown to be true of children whose parents smoke, so it doesn't mean that you have to be a smoker. They have been exposed to smoke in childhood, um, as well as personal history of cigarette smoking. Um, interestingly, there was a study in Sweden that showed that 
In Sweden, some people use smokeless tobacco, and those people weren't at increased risk of MS, while those who smoked cigarettes were. So it's really something about the product, the cigarette itself, and some of the toxins, perhaps, that are relevant to MS risk. We'll talk a lot more about vitamin D and its link with MS. In the past few years, there have been some really interesting studies looking at obesity or being overweight as a risk factor for MS. The first looked at people um, in a large sort of ongoing study. Um, this is done by a group in Boston. And they had asked these people, you know, when you were younger, what did your body shape look like? They actually had like, a little diagram. And they saw that people who said that they, when they were late adolescents, they were heavier, they were more likely to have MS later in development life. And a more recent study done in Southern California, where they actually measured weight and height and were able to calculate this body mass index in kids, showed that those with higher body mass index were at increased risk of going on to then develop MS in childhood. So I think that's um, really interesting, and whether that's related to the actual obesity itself, to the diet that sort of perpetuates obesity, or to bacteria in the gut that might actually um, you know, increase your risk for obesity is still totally unknown. Um, and that just points to the fact that I think there are probably many factors in the environment we really haven't even thought of yet. But certainly, this rapid increase in the incidence of MS and the changing characteristics where more women are getting the disease than men really does tell you we've got to focus a little bit more energy in that department. <clears throat> so I told you genes and environment come together, and I really just think of it almost like a perfect storm, uh, where it sets off the immune system dysfunction that we know characterizes MS. And what is the immune system? Many of you probably know this, but, uh, but if you don't, this is a system of cells and organs in your body that's there to protect you. It's there to protect you against viruses and other infections. It's there to protect any random stray cell that could turn cancers from taking over your body. So it's really supposed to be doing a good job of protecting you. But instead, in autoimmune diseases, the immune system somehow gets tricked into thinking that a part of your body uh, that's supposed to be there doesn't belong. Um, and depending on where in your uh, body the immune system gets tricked, you might have a different kind of autoimmune disease. So you've probably seen people with psoriasis, where they have you know, flaky, patchy red skin. That's an autoimmune disease. Or things like lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis, the young age one, where people get really swollen joints and that become very disfigured. Those are all autoimmune diseases. Um, and they attack skin, or they attack the joints. Uh, and MS, uh, uh, you probably all know that, that it's said the immune system attacks the coating around the wires in our brain. The wires basically are a big electrical network, just like the wires you see outside. If you strip the coating off, they don't work as well. OK, so going back to vitamin D, again, just want to review what is the evidence that vitamin D is associated with MS risk. And even if we do establish that we believe that vitamin D insufficiency or low levels of vitamin D increase the risk of MS, how do we know that it seems to be important for people already living with the disease? So the sun is the best source of vitamin D in humans. Uh, none of us are getting any now, but that's OK. And what happens is that the sun, when it contacts our skin, uh, creates a chemical process starting. So there's a cholesterol in our skin um, that gets converted through several pathways, ultimately gets converted by the liver and then the kidney into active vitamin D. So the interest in vitamin D as a risk factor for MS began because we know that MS is not distributed equally around the world. Um, and in areas where it's easily studied, because MS really isn't studied in continents like Africa. But if you look over here in the US and Canada, going down into sort of Central and then South America, we can see that MS is more common the farther away from the equator you go. So here's the equator. Um, so red is increased MS risk, or the highest risk of MS. We can see that uh, MS in 
the northern part of the United States, Canada, the northern parts of Europe, is much more common than lower down closer to the equator, where things are sort of this yellow, tannish, lower risk. And then, same thing, actually in the southern hemisphere, uh, you see that MS is much more common farther from the equator. And so, sunlight obviously is distributed the same way. We get more sun exposure in the tropics uh, than in uh, you know, Canada, or period right now. <laughs> Uh, and so people started to say, well, what is it about, you know, is there something that links to the sun exposure that might be related? So here's a map where I transposed that same map, just focusing on sort of the U.S. and Canada. And on the left, you see that the dark gray shaded area, the northern part of the United States, is actually part of the country. In the winter, your body, if you sat outside all day without clothes on, you couldn't really make enough vitamin D your levels in the sufficient range. So that kind of overlaps a lot, doesn't it? High risk red area, not able to make vitamin D. Really interesting ecological data suggesting that um, vitamin D might in fact be that link between the north and south gradient. So what does vitamin D do and why would this even be important? You know, the main role of vitamin D is that it helps your body take in calcium. So your kidney tells your body, like, let's make more of this active vitamin D because the body needs to absorb more calcium. But we do know that it also affects the immune system. And in mice uh, who are given vitamin D or exposed to UV light, uh, they're much less likely to then go on to develop the mouse form of multiple sclerosis. And if they do develop it, it tends to be less severe. And so there was a really elegant study done, again, by the group at Harvard, uh, looking at members of the military. So I didn't know this until I read, started becoming a doctor and reading these studies, but when people join the military, they give a blood sample um, when they start up and then every year after that. And so the military has this huge like storage container, I guess, or breathers, that breathers of blood samples. And so this group said, well, let's look at the blood levels of people who went on later after they joined the military to develop uh, MS and compare the vitamin D levels earlier on to vitamin D levels in people who never developed MS. And what they found is that people who had a higher levels of vitamin D were less likely to then get MS. So this is a, a scientific graph showing that. So uh, if your baseline risk is here, represented by this horizontal line, they said as the levels of vitamin D got higher, the risk was below the average of getting MS. So those who had levels in this highest uh, vitamin D uh, grouping were much less likely to get MS. And that corresponds to a blood level, what we would call 40 nanograms per milliliter. Just keep in your mind for later. So absent actually doing a trial where we ask people to uh, you know, supplement their children with vitamin D for 20, 30 years and wait and see if we can prevent MS by doing that. Really, I think we have pretty strong evidence that vitamin D insufficiency or low levels of vitamin D might really be linked to an increased risk of getting MS. Um, it would be awesome to do a prevention trial. You know, and vitamin D insufficiency or low levels have been linked with other autoimmune diseases too. So. Maybe if we had widespread campaigns to supplement the vitamin D, we'd really be making a dent in these diseases. I had an idea. Did anyone have switch when they were little, like fluoride, we did at school? Like, we would just give everybody a little vitamin D at school uh, and keep their levels up. The other interesting thing is we don't really know like, when the best period of life would be. Like, is it protective mostly when you're still in utero or? and you keep taking vitamin D, is there like a certain time of your life where you really would have the most bang for its buck? Um, so that would be another kind of interesting thing to do in terms of thinking about preventing MS and other diseases that might be related to low vitamin D. I may be able to take a break. Does anyone have any burning questions right now? Yeah. So, why won't we just, like, there are people who are, like, 
Right, so the question is, if there's such a strong link between maybe vitamin D and who knows diet and other things, uh, why not just educate people to do that? Uh, to prevent it. Ah, yeah, I'm totally with you. I think that prevention is key. Um, that being said, uh, hanging out with Dr. Dave Smith and others, and I'm uh, like, you know, eating like, you know, pizza and other, and other things with them. So, I mean, I think it's hard to change human behaviors. We know that. You know, healthy diets and exercise are really important for many other diseases. Yeah, we all have kind of cheat, don't we? Yeah. Right, so food safety and sanitation. I mean, some studies really suggest that actually being too sanitary might increase your risk of autoimmune, autoimmune diseases. So I think. Yeah. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, I think there's just a lot of work to be done in this realm. So I totally agree. The prevention realm is key. It's one of the big tenets of the MS society. Is it? Like, how can we prevent this disease from starting in the first place? I'm on that page. So the next question is: Should you know people with MS actually be taking vitamin D supplements? Um, so thinking about mice, uh, mice who have the MS sort of model of the disease, so they already have the disease, and if they're given vitamin D, then it seems to help slow down the severity of the disease more quickly. Interestingly, this, in this mouse study in particular, they found that that might only be true in the female mice, in the gals, so the vitamin D effects actually might differ by gender. In humans, I would say we're not sure if vitamin D supplementation helps. Why people say it's a vitamin, like what, what are I going to do? Why might vitamin D not be helpful for everyone? Or why might it be uh, harmful for some people? So um, these are some really complex things. I'm not going to be doing an immunology lecture here. But vitamin D um, impacts many parts of the immune system. And it's really hard to study. I always say the immune system in MS to me is a little bit like a spider web because you don't really know what the starting point of the problem was. And so you have, you think you're doing one thing that's good by impacting one area, but it might be setting off like a domino effect on another part of the immune system that isn't so good. There are some studies that suggest that vitamin D might regulate genes that are related to MS in a bad way. That might pick up some genes that um, are known to be associated with MS risk or severity. Um, vitamin D has a lot of effects otherwise in the body. So, for example, if you have too much vitamin D, it might predispose you to developing kidney stones. So, I think um, those are just some sort of simple examples about you know why it's not just like you know I'll just take it; it'll be fine. But what is the evidence that vitamin D might be linked up with a better disease course, taking vitamin D might be linked up with a better disease course for people with MS. So we did one study in children with MS uh, at UCSF when I was out in San Francisco. And these kids were so nice. They gave a blood sample the first time we saw them in the clinic, and then we saw them over and over again, and we figured out, well, are they having attacks of MS or not? And then we went back to those blood samples, and we measured vitamin D levels in them. And we saw a pretty strong association between higher levels of vitamin D and fewer attacks. So people who had levels of like just 10 nanograms per milliliter, that's the unit, 10 units higher, um, were, had about a third less attacks than um, those who had the lower levels. So that's a pretty strong link between vitamin D levels. And that was true regardless of the racial or ethnic background. We didn't see any difference in girls or boys. You know, we didn't see any difference if people were taking MS medicines or not. Um, and then not long thereafter, this group in Australia did the same kind of a study in adults with MS. We saw almost the same results. So higher levels of vitamin D, fewer attacks in adults with MS. And these were vitamin D levels that were measured before the attacks had occurred. And then some people said, well, maybe you're just measuring the attacks wrong, or you don't really know. 
What about its effect on MRI? So MS, of course, causes these white spots that don't belong to show up on MRI scan. And you can measure the number of new spots that are occurring over time. And the spots are kind of a marker of these attacks that you may or may not feel. And if the spots are more active at the time you do the MRI scan, they will light up the dye. So we call those enhancing lesions. And we looked in a group of almost 500 adults um, at vitamin D levels and whether they were corresponding with the number of spots that showed up on the MRI scan as well as the number of more active spots. And we saw that 10 unit higher levels of vitamin D were associated with about a 15% reduction in the number of new spots overall, and about a one-third uh, reduction in the number of enhancing spots, spots that fit up the dye. Then we got really interested uh, in thinking about vitamin D and progression of disability, because spots and attacks uh, are certainly relevant, but we know that for people who eventually develop secondary progressive MS or potentially have more of a progressive MS from onset, um, the long-term thing we're concerned about is how much damage is being done to the nerves underneath, independent of all the attacks um, or the, the coating around the nerves getting stripped off. So, for example, here's a healthy-looking brain, and here you can see the folds of the brain are much deeper. That's because some of the brain tissue has been lost. And you can actually measure how much brain tissue loss is going on using MRI scan. And in particular, one part of the brain tissue is called gray matter. And so gray matter seems to be the most tightly linked uh, with long-term risk of disability in MS. So people who are losing more gray matter on their MRI scan early on are much more likely to have disability several years down the road. And we saw a pretty strong link here between vitamin D levels also in this five-year study and preservation of gray matter. So basically, now at 30 unit higher vitamin D level, you had about 2% more gray matter over a pretty short time period, a little less than two years, compared to those with the lower levels of vitamin D. So who's convinced? Everybody on vitamin D, anybody? <laughs> uh, everybody's on vitamin D. So um, I'm still, I'm, I'm always a scientist, I guess, and, I, and I, I'm very excited by our results. I think they're really compelling. But I'm still worried, what if we're going to be doing the wrong thing? It's so easy just to tell everyone, we'll just take vitamin D. But um, in other disease states, you see medications, or even just more simply, vitamin D supplements, that seem equally interesting and promising in the same kinds of studies we've done in MS that turn out to be duds when you actually test them. So that's why I think we need a clinical trial. So who started folic acid? Everybody who's ever been pregnant, right? So folic acid was thought in these large groups of people, higher folic acid levels were associated with lower risks of colon cancer. So everyone was like, oh, folic acid is so good, it prevents colon cancer. Finally, somebody did a clinical trial to see does folic acid supplementation actually help prevent colon cancer. And the exact opposite thing was true. Those who were in the folic acid supplementation group had higher risks of developing three cancers and colon lesions than those who were not getting folic acid. Beta carotene, another great example. This is a really famous um, study, the carrot study. So beta carotene in these large groups of people looked initially to be really protective against getting heart disease. And they did this huge randomized trial where some people got beta carotene and others didn't. And not only did those who got the beta carotene have more heart disease, they also got lung cancer. So <clears throat> I think that you know we need to be careful. It may be that vitamin D is just as awesome as it looks in these observational studies. But I think we really we have the ability to test whether supplementation is helpful and not harmful, and we should. And why can our studies be wrong? Like, what could we be missing if they are wrong? We think that low vitamin D levels are associated with decreased MS risk, with developing more attacks, with developing 
poor spots on the MRI scan and with increased loss of brain tissue. That's what we think is going on. But maybe it's just that people who have more severe MS, for whatever reason, even before it's manifested as that severe, somehow hate the sun more than those who have less severe MS. And so they go out in the sun less and their vitamin D levels are lower. Or maybe people whose levels of vitamin D are low have low levels of actually another important vitamin or something else in their diet that's not quite right, that's really responsible for um, this apparent association, uh, but that we really need to be targeting selenium or, or something else uh, that's linked to low vitamin D, but is actually the cause of what we think is a vitamin D association. So this is a, these are some funny pictures I took. Um, I went to Botswana when I was a neurology resident, and I did see somebody, I think, had MS. They always say there's no MS in Africa. I'm not really sure that's true, but there's a little, uh, that's a little hiding under the shade of the, the tree in the hot sun. And this was in, in Greece, where a whole bunch of people were doing the same. I mean, nobody feels really comfortable in hot house. Maybe there is a point at which you can have too much vitamin D. The other thing is that if just because something's available over the counter doesn't mean that it's safe. So the FDA first doesn't really regulate our supplements as tightly as they recommend uh, regulate other medications. And I think anytime you're taking something, you're putting something into your body, altering your diet, you're trying to use that intervention as a medication. So we really should expect the same amount of um, scientific rigor to support its use when we're recommending it, especially as doctors, as we would if for, you know, interferons or, or uh, you know, natalizumab. You should really expect that as doctors we should deliver that same amount of evidence to you that you're doing the right thing. So that's why we're doing this vitamin D trial. Now, people who haven't participated in trials often say, well, what is a trial and what's different about it than what's normally going on in my world. So for people with MS, clinical trials um, come in many different flavors. Um, normally what happens in a trial is that there are a series of eligibility criteria. So some people may not be eligible for a particular study. And there are a lot of reasons for excluding people from a study that might relate to other potential bad effects of the drug that you just kind of want to take out of the picture for this study. Um, a lot of trials, if they're looking, for example, at the, uh, they're trying to see, well, does this medication reduce relapse rate? They don't, they should probably not see people with progressive disease if they're not having relapses, because they're not going to have those anyways. Uh, so those are the, sort of the eligibility criteria, I see the first things that you encounter when you think about enrolling in a trial. And then once you're enrolled, people are usually enrolled into one of several arms of the trial. So you might be enrolled into the active, you know, the drug you're studying versus a placebo, or the medication you're studying, you know, versus a known medication for MS. And then patients are typically followed in a study, um, sometimes more frequently than you would be a clinic, actually, to see are any things changing on your exam? Are you having attacks? Are you having these spots show up on the MRI scans? Um, and so the clinical trials are pretty helpful in a way that these observational studies can't be, because when you're in a trial, typically you don't, you may not know what medicine you're getting. And often the doctor who's decided you know, does whatever symptom you have uh, count as a relapse also doesn't know what you're on. So we call that blinding. So you're a little less biased by what you know about the person. So it kind of, it's a higher standard of rigor. And then the other thing is when you do this randomization, it's, it's like flipping a coin. So you'll end up in placebo arm or in the, the study medication arm based on random chance. So if there's something about being a woman that really is important or would have otherwise influenced the results of the study, the women are distributed equally in the two arms. Ages of the patients tend to be similar in the two arms. So it takes out all of the other factors that might cause a false association. So that's clinical trials are really kind of the gold standard for proving that an intervention is helpful. So clinical trials that have already occurred for vitamin D, 
um, are pretty limited. And they had some problems with the way they were designed in a large part that might make the data they've given sort of uninterpretable. So there's one study done in Canada with about 50 patients. They had relaxing or getting MS. And um, half of the patients were randomized to sort of this escalating pretty high doses of vitamin D. And half of the patients were told, well, you can take whatever vitamin D you want up to a level of about 4,000 units a day, but didn't really collect information about what those patients were actually taking. And then they only saw the people in follow-up regularly if they were in one arm, so they weren't blinded. And then um, they said, at the end, like, oh, like these people who took higher doses had fewer attacks um, and less disability. That's not a well-designed clinical trial, so it doesn't really give us that much more information than we've had already. There was a small study that um, generated a lot of concern because in 23 patients with MS, half were given vitamin D and um, half were given a lower dose of vitamin D. And they said, oh, the higher dose doesn't help. So it's only 23 patients. <laughs> so there are ways to estimate or calculate mathematically how many people do you need to actually even show a difference. So based on our data, we'd probably need close to 100 patients. So not finding an effect of vitamin D in a group of 20 patients only tells you it was probably too small a sample to really be confident in that result. Then there was a study done in Europe looking at patients, again, randomized to high doses of vitamin D or placebo for about a year. And they did see those who were in the vitamin D group had fewer new white spots showing up on the MRI scan. The only problem is that they, when they did this randomization, the flip of the coin, it wasn't a good flip. So more people um, ended up with certain characteristics uh, in one arm compared to the other. And they didn't take that into account when they did the, the statistical analyses. So the most promising, I have to say, of all of them, this is the most hopeful one I have for vitamin D having an effect, but the jury is still out. So, the trial that I'm working on now with Dr. Uh, Smith and many others throughout the country is sponsored by the National MS Society. People who are eligible for the study first start on one medication for MS called glutyramine acetate or Copaxone. And if the medicine is selling well with them over the first month, they're able to do the injections and everything, they then are randomized, they have this flip of the coin, to a high dose of vitamin D, which is 5,000 units a day or to the recommended daily allowance of vitamin D, which is 600 units a day. And it's a two-year study, and we're just following people to see what happens. Are you developing fewer or more attacks? Uh, what's going on in the MRI and that sort of thing. So people always say, well, how did you choose 5,000 units of vitamin D as the dose for your trial? Uh, and what we know, I told you before, that people whose levels were over 40 were protected from getting MS. And then in our own studies, we know that people whose levels uh, were up to 60 had fewer attacks or white spots showing up. And beyond 60, we don't know, because nobody had levels that high. So uh, there are two different ways of calculating units of vitamin D, but that range of 40 to 60 was my target. And that corresponds to 100 to 150 on this particular way of measuring vitamin D. And you can see in this other study, this was a study of healthy people who got varying doses of vitamin D. Those who got 5,000 units a day ended up right in the middle of that range. And so that's how we chose 5,000 units. And then people said, well, why aren't you just doing a placebo controlled study? I said, you know, the government tells us we should all be taking at least 600 units of vitamin D. So I'm not the, the whole, at least the recommended allowance for people for two years while we do this study. So our initial plan was to have eight sites for the vitamin D trial. What we actually have is 15 and counting. Um, and so the trials take quite a bit of time to start up. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we've added sites, because many of the sites have only just started recruiting in the past six months or so. So we wanted to kind of have some catch up. We've enrolled almost half of the people we expect to include in the date. So we're pretty confident that with really excellent uh, help from the participants in the study, 
and from my colleagues throughout the nation that we should be able to finish enrolling hopefully by the summer. Since it's a two-year study, then by the summer of 2016, we should have our results. There are a few other studies going on now um, throughout the world looking at vitamin D. One is a study called the Solar Study. They're using a much higher dose of vitamin D, 14,000 units a day, versus placebo. And they're using that as an add-on to one of the interferon medications. And so the study design is not that dissimilar from what we're doing. The dose is really different. So it's going to get patients into a pretty different range of vitamin D levels than what we have experienced as probably effective, if at all effective, for MS. So we'll see. That'll really tell us comparing these two to some extent. You know, does the, is higher and higher better, or is there a point at which you really don't want your vitamin D levels to be much higher? Um, they've already done a pilot study of just 20,000 units uh, daily just to see if it was safe, and they didn't see any bad effects in the patients. So, you know, to date in our study, we really haven't had any bad effects we've seen with the 5,000 units a day. So we're really hopeful and confident that we've chosen a, a safe dose. There's a trial that's starting up in Germany, uh, looking at 10,000 units a day compared to a really low dose. And they're looking to see if that impacts the number of new MS spots that shows up on the end, show up on the MRI scan. There's another study looking at really high doses of vitamin D given only twice a month, 100,000 units uh, at a time, but given only two times a month compared to placebo, and looking at how that might impact relapses. And then, interestingly, in the Middle East, there are a few studies starting up as well, looking at more of a traditional dosing of 50,000 units a week uh, to see if that's helpful for uh, people with MS. So, People always ask me, well, why isn't this study done yet? You know, why does it take so long? And in general, it's really frustrating, I know, as a patient, to, uh, to try to figure out, why don't we have more medications available? So I just like to think about that, too, when discussing clinical trials. Um, I did some background reading on this for another talk I was giving, and it was fascinating to find out that just to get to a point where you have two to three medications that are safe enough to test in humans, you have to screen five to 10,000 new compounds. That's pretty crazy. And then of those, only 250 may get to the point where you feel confident enough that it's safe and reasonable to test in animals. And of those, 10 are even suitable for initial testing in humans. And then again, only two to three of those ultimately pass the initial safety screens but can then go on to be tested. Um, the other thing that's Frustrating, I know, is that for people with progressive MS, it's like, well, why aren't these medicines working, or you know, why aren't we testing them more in progressive uh, MS patients? And you know, I think most of us think that the targets of medications are probably pretty different for people with progressive MS compared to relapsing MS. So I told you earlier that with progressive MS, what we think is going on is that um, the nerves themselves are being damaged. Now, we don't even know exactly when that's important, but it probably starts um, early in the course of MS. And then, you know, there's a critical threshold, um, and your body can't kind of compensate for it anymore. So the nerve damage becomes more and more apparent. Um, that's really different from the kind of thing we're talking about with relapsing MS, where the immune system is attacking the coating around the nerves and, you know, causing this area of inflammation. So we have a lot of medicines that are good at kind of preventing that sort of problem where the immune system is attacking coating around nerves, we have very limited information about how to protect the nerves themselves from ongoing damage. So two different targets, and of course, once you know we figured out like, oh, we can use ways of manipulating the immune system to stop these attacks, it's kind of easier to go on and say, well, what if we did this to the immune system or that? And luckily the MS society now is really turning back and saying, we really have to figure out this other major problem, how we stop the nerves themselves from being damaged. So I think that you're going to see a lot more studies of uh, people with progressive MS, but they may be totally different medications than we're testing in relapsing the babies. And so, say you found this like exciting you know, medication to try out. Um, so you take mice with um, 
say the mouse type of MS, you say, oh, they have this really interesting elevation of compound X um, in these mice, and the mice that have you know, the most severe forms of the disease are really high levels of this compound. So the company says, gee, let's try to see if we can block it. They make this medication to block it, and they can do it. They say the same thing in MS. Oh, those MS patients who have more severe disease have higher levels of this compound, too. Let's see if we can block it. Uh, so once they figured out in the mice, you know, they figure out what doses might be helpful, got to test it in people. So the stages of clinical trials in people uh, are broken down into four stages or phases. In the first, usually it's a really small number of people who are tested in phase one. Um, and sometimes that's even done in healthy people where they're just looking at stage E and changing doses around to see how much is too much. Then, if it passes that phase, they'll say, let's take a little bit bigger group of people with MS now and see how you say for people with MS, and is there any sort of signal we can get from blood tests or MRI that might be working. And then they do these huge trials where they say, we're really going for the whole goal now. Like, let's see if compound X blocker works. And then if it gets approved, if it makes it through and gets approved, then we're following the medicine for safety. So it's a really prolonged process. Trials are really expensive. They're very hard to start up. They're challenging to report. And um, then it can take a while to wrap up things. You've got a lot of data to process and collect. So it's totally understandable, understandable why people get frustrated. I'm frustrated too. But it's a very, very complicated process from start to finish. So while we're waiting for these trials, you know, should all of you who have MS or who are interested in MS and prevention of MS to taking vitamin D. Um, the first thing people ask me is, well, what, you know, my one doctor told me to take 50,000 units a week, you're telling me to do this, what's the difference? So there have been studies looking at how often you dose vitamin D that don't show a very big difference. Um, so if you give the same amount of vitamin D, whether it's split up daily, or weekly, or monthly, the blood levels, here are the blood levels on the y-axis of this graph, go up pretty much the same way. Vitamin D2, which is the weekly one, or vitamin D3 is another question uh, people ask. You know, these have not been studied by well people with MS, but it looks like D3 is a little bit more potent than D2 in getting the blood levels up. So my personal bet is D3. Um, and then how, do you, how much to take? So, you know, again, with the understanding that you're not even sure this is the right thing to do. If you're going to take vitamin D, and this is what I talk to my patients about, I say, well, let's check your blood level, and our goal is going to be to get your level above 40. You know, that was the protective level. And somewhere between that and 60, which is the levels we saw, vitamin D might have an impact. And above that, I'm not sure if it's safe or effective, so we're not aiming that high. So most of my patients end up getting between Two to 4,000 units to end up in that range. And we just start with those. We guess based on how low they can get. You know, if they start at 10, they're probably going to be higher doses. So, and then we recheck a blood level after they've been taking the vitamin D for a few months um, and see if it really has reached that target range. And then some people really do have contraindications to taking a lot of vitamin D. So, uh, it's not something I usually recommend that people just go out and start taking on their own. Um, you should probably talk with your doctor to make sure that you don't have any of these contraindications. So, um, you know, I hope I've convinced you that higher levels of vitamin D are associated with fewer attacks and, and new white spots and <coughs> preserved brain tissue. Um, but also, just a little bit of, of careful reflection to understand that you know, we don't actually know for sure that supplementing people with vitamin D is safe or effective. Um, and we really need these clinical trials to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, and again, in the meantime, probably most of you are taking vitamin D, but definitely if not, or if you have questions, talk to your doctor because that's uh, right here. <coughs> so just want to acknowledge first uh, all the patients I've interacted with throughout the years. Uh, I don't know, watching videos like the one we just saw, thinking about my patients living with MS. Definitely the reason to get up and go to work every morning. Um, uh, great mentors throughout the years who have really inspired me to 
think about to become engaged in MS, just like uh, you know, Ross student has been. His colleagues all around the country and the National MS Society as well. So happy to take questions. Thank you very much for listening. Does sunscreen interfere with the absorption of vitamin D? So I don't know if you remember. The question is: Does sunscreen uh, interfere with vitamin D absorption? Absolutely. Yep. So that might be one reason among many. You know, right. just think about my childhood compared to kids now. Like I don't know, we just went outside and wear sunblock. If we came in, my mom's like, "Oh, you want me to find something for you to do?" <laughs> and we would just leave. And we're like, "That's okay. I love you." Um, but now, you know, a lot of kids are indoors, and if they're out, they're getting lathered and lathered. So that might be a reason why so many of us are turning up with low vitamin D levels. Yes? I'm doing this detailed treatment for the Yeah. Is that Uh-huh. Right, so the question is, you know, how are we supplementing and at what doses? So the, the vitamin D deficiency literature is mostly based on orthopedic stuff because vitamin D is related to yeah right. So that's related to bone health. Uh, and so a lot of people with MS have been told just because that's what people do for bone health, like oh just take this you know weekly supplement. And that doesn't average out to be even as much as we're using in the trial if you divide it by seven days. Um, and again, since we know that it probably doesn't matter if you're taking it daily, weekly, or monthly, even um, in terms of getting your levels up. In theory, it's okay. In my practice, I don't really see that that regimen works very well. Um, and then the other question is, you know, if you start off deficient and you take vitamin D, you know, can you just stop it? The answer is no. You have an ongoing need for vitamin D. So um, if you were a person who was deficient before and you want to keep your levels in a certain range, you've got to keep on the vitamin supplements. Yes? What other um, vitamins and minerals are needed for the vitamin D to be absorbed in the cell that once you take it? So the question is, um, when you take the vitamin D, what else do you need to make it come in? Um, so it's a fat absorbed vitamin, actually. Um, so some vitamins, things in our diet, kind of get into the gut at any time. Others require a little boost, and vitamin D is one of them. So um, I often wonder about that, too, if people aren't eating enough fat in their diets, did that influence or be a reason why you know their vitamin D levels are low? We don't really know a lot about like when you actually take your dose of vitamin D. Does that matter? Should you always be taking it? Just a meal that has some fat in it. I usually recommend that people do take it for the normal meal. Um, but that hasn't been studied very carefully. Yes? Um, this is a research in a part of like a mega fatty acids, you know, like kind of a fish. Yeah. Those are good to help like improve like this. Uh, I guess it helps your brain tissue you know? You know, so what about like a uh, things like that? Is it that good for like people with MS? You know, you want to improve that tissue on where your wife's body right? Right, so the question is, is there any role for fish oils or omega-3s, that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the jury's a little bit out on fish oils and the omega-3s. There have been limited, limited randomized trials of these interventions in people with MS, but most of them have been small. So it's the same thing as with the MS, uh, or with the uh, vitamin D pilot studies. It's not really clear if it's helpful. I haven't seen any that shown harm, but that also requires sometimes a larger number of people to study. So we don't have great evidence yet about omega-3. Do doctors, especially neurologists, check for the vitamin D level in MS patients? Do they already attain that vitamin D level? So the question is, are neurologists checking vitamin D levels in MS patients? And um, I definitely think that it's highly variable, actually. So um, 
So sometimes I think the patients are their own best advocates. They, they're like, well, I think my doctor uh, checked. In MS centers, like places where I work, I know we all check vitamin D levels and are supplementing people. Even though we don't know, but I see a lot of people who go to community physicians and may not be checking that. Is this vitamin D thing is all it's really been in the last couple of years? Yeah, the vitamin D data are really new. And in fact, in that study I told you about where we had almost 500 people, we actually were tracking, we were asking people every year you know, what vitamins and supplements are you taking. I think there were like 9% of people at the first year who said they were taking some vitamin D supplementation, and by the end of the five years, it was like almost 50%. And that was even before some of the, the newer data had come out. So it really had kind of markedly increased in a pretty short period of time. Hang on, I'll come right back to you. Where is it? Oh, it's working. Mary Ann, get the microphone. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking, it was ironic, I had my first vitamin D level drawn to my OB guidance doctor because I have osteoporosis, and it was critically low. So I've been taking vitamin D for osteoporosis, and now I have it's also helpful with the Yeah, so vitamin D is a really interesting um, thing in our body. It's a Acknowledges that's the other numbers. That's actually true. Some vitamins, some vitamins don't have that. There are some vitamins that are tested by laboratories. Right. So the question is if the lab that makes it puts on the label and they've tested it and claim that it's true. It's true. It's I mean, I have no idea. It's an independent lab that has to put it on that label. Yeah. I, I, it's, you think so, but I don't know. It's, like I said, it's not as tightly regulated as the sort of main medication industry. Okay, next question. If you have um, primary progressive or secondary progressive MS, is vitamin D as effective still? It's a great question. So does it matter if you have more of a progressive type of MS? And it's been harder to study, uh, you know, if vitamin D levels are linked to more progression. The, the reason that I kind of treat MS and vitamin D equally is because of our results showing that vitamin D seems to protect against the loss of tissue that we think is what underlies progressive MS. But because it's more rare, it's harder to kind of accumulate the group of people that's large enough to study in the same way that, as we do with relaxing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just based on the MRI data, I would probably, and you know, vitamin D, low vitamin D levels have been linked with other diseases where there's a lot of damage to the underlying nerves, like we see in progressive MS, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and things like that. So I think there's other rationale to support that it may help protect nerves from, from you know, getting injured. Next question. When uh, you're testing blood levels for vitamin D, what type of test do you recommend? There are several out there. Uh, 
auto or immune radioactive immune tests and different chromatography tests and that kind of stuff. Which one do you use? Well, um, so the question is, you know, is there a specific type of vitamin D testing that's the method that's better than the other? I mean, most people think that the, the special kind of testing called liquid chromatography aspect is best. But honestly, when you're a doctor or when you go to a doctor, you're kind of at the mercy of where your institution sends the blood to. So you just kind of have to work with it and go from there. Um, you know, and the, the levels aren't that far off from one method to the next, but you know, if you are a little bit borderline with one of the ones that tends to register the vitamin D low, you might push it a teeny bit higher. Um, it's a good question. Um, I have a question. My husband just um, was diagnosed with primary aggressive MS. Um, two questions. One, he also has diabetes. How does that affect? The other question is we have two um, daughters in their 20s. Should they be tested for vitamin D? I have a granddaughter. Really excellent question. So the first is does vitamin D link up with other diseases? Um, it has been linked with many other autoimmune diseases. Um, you know, whether it links with type 2 diabetes, presuming that's your mind. I haven't really seen that, but to be honest, I'm not as familiar with that literature because um, it's not really in the autoimmune spectrum. Um, and then secondly, what about if you're a person living with MS and you have descendants? Should they be, should they be taking vitamin D? I actually tell my patients to have talk with their pediatricians or get older children to have them talk with their doctor about whether that's a good idea. Um, again, we're not going to know, even if in our wildest dreams we can get you know, some windfall of money to do a 20 to 30 year study to see if vitamin D supplements prevent. Um, and that's in related autoimmune diseases. We're not really going to know for years and years. It's too late for your, your kids and your grandkids, right? So, uh, so I think it's definitely worth talking, having them talk to their doctors or their talk to their pediatricians. The reason I don't say like, I just go do it is they may have stuff that you don't know about or that only the pediatrician knows about that might be a contraindication for them. So it's a good idea to have have the discussion with their own provider, but I think it's worth considering. I probably would think about it if I were a person living in that mess. I would probably think about it. For my kids. So. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, as far as like, MS, did you ever find any correlation with like massage therapy helping to relieve MS? Okay. So the question is, does massage therapy help relieve MS? I mean, I don't know if anyone who does it. I'm not going to yeah, I think so, and this is a question more about exercise and therapy. I think there are really good studies indicating that, you know, exercising your muscles, stretching, are very helpful for your day-to-day -day living, and that they also might be helpful at protecting you from long-term worsening. They're probably more justified, you know, when you're not starting I think the strain strenuousness is uh, debatable. I mean, there are some people who think strenuous exercise could be good, keeping those neurons healthy. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I feel like it's a very helpful thing for me. Next question. Oh, that's real, that's real. Yeah. Um, the, the research shows that children with active vitamin D levels get sick less. If you give them more, it doesn't help them. So in relation to MS, knowing that, okay, we're seeing this trend that people have less relapses that are brain volume and all that. Um, can you, do you have any idea what's going on with vitamin D? Because it works in many, many different ways in our body. So what mechanism of action do you think is happening? Yeah, so there's, there, that's sort of a double edged sword. Actually, there has been a study where they gave kids vitamin D and they did develop fewer infections. So supplementation, in fact, could be helpful in preventing uh, infections as well. But that, that problem highlights um, highlights that just because blood levels are linked with an outcome doesn't mean that supplementing necessarily will help. We always have to keep in mind that the blood levels could be confounded by other things. For example, in MS, um, one group in Australia showed that ultraviolet light itself has immune modulating properties independent of its boosting of vitamin D levels. 
So that could be another reason why sunlight seems to be helpful, and maybe vitamin D levels are just sort of a byproduct. You actually we should all be sitting in sun lamps right now. Um, the mechanisms are really almost too hard to speculate because the correlation, you know, between the mouse model and humans, I think, is is not perfect. And um, so we know that you know vitamin D helps with various aspects of the immune system and um, helps you know, promote these downplaying T regulatory cells and helps, or rather, sort of helping boost the T regulatory cells and helps downplay the, the pro inflammation kind of cells. And, you know, and separating out the effects is really difficult. And you know, where in that chain vitamin D is acting? If it's acting at one place and then that's having a phenomenal effect where it's kind of acting simultaneously at multiple things. It's just really difficult to say. We've got time for about two long-winded questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions or answers? Yes, answers. That's it. Does anybody need them? Yes, hang on. I'm coming back. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, it would be interesting that FDA approved, I think, 10 now, and those drugs. Um, that's going to be a challenge, I think, in terms of research uh, about vitamin D and the interactions because people will be on different drugs, um, some of them pretty significant. And so how does that challenge you as a researcher in terms of finding the true answers about vitamin D? Yeah, that's a great question. So how do we take into account uh, you know, other medications that people might be on? One way we do that is by how we design trials. So for example, in our trial, we're restricting people to one medication for MS so that we really are isolating the effects of vitamin D in the context of use of that medication. And that's true for you know, different add-ons for others of these vitamin D therapies. But there are many add-on trials of people taking, I don't know, gold lot or other things like that to the best of my knowledge. So the question is, are we going to feel confident enough in our results to say, will these results also apply to people on Golmod or Nebulismab, it's a really tough question because there could be a, a bad interaction that we don't know about. Um, and, and the question is, you know, hopefully with the advent of more and more MS therapies, you know, we have to at some point weigh the risks and benefits of retesting in this population, in this population, in this population versus the expense. And at what point do you put that down and say, we're not funding another clinical trial? And now those are the patients, we're going to use that money to test, you know, omegas or something else because we feel confident enough in our vitamin D results to say, like, okay, we're just going to have to assume that that's the same and move on to some other important areas of research that needs to be tackled. Hold on just a second. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I promise. Yes, I have a question. You already don't have the uh, aggressive MS so the question is, if you have progressive MS, will it help? We don't know because we don't even know if actually supplementing helps relapsing MS, but because we see that the levels seem to be linked with less loss of the gray matter of brain tissue, which we think is a marker of progression of MS, I think right now we don't see any reason to suppose that it would be acting you know, differently or badly in that group. Uh, it would be nice to do a progressive MS trial also, I think, but uh, maybe not <laughs> one at a time. Yeah, well, I just want to know, like, uh, as far as, like, maybe uh, how does the, like, cholesterol levels, you know, and, like, blood sugar and, like, the, the lymphatic system, how does that relate to MS, you know, we find these studies like SAMA, like, I mean, you know what I'm saying, like, like, right. people high cholesterol, like, Develop MS or you know people's lymphatic system that they could might develop mm -hmm. or their blood sugar. Right. So the question is basically about how other diseases might impact MS, and you know there are a million other diseases. So to try to isolate one from the other could be difficult. Uh, you know, I generally think that if your other diseases are well controlled, you're probably going to be feeling worse generally, right? Um, and studies have shown that we call, uh, when you're studying MS and you're looking at other diseases, we call those comorbidities. And studies 
from the Austin Archons database um, show that having more comorbidities <laughs> can be linked with a worse MS course. And then people have actually tried to see if cholesterol lowering medicine um, had an impact on MS. And have had, they've had these small studies, so too small to be definitive. So uh, I think the jury's still out. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, we all get other things too, right? I always tell people with MS, listen, if you have a sudden onset of problems where you can't speak or move one half of your body, just because you have MS doesn't mean you can't get a stroke or a heart attack or something else like the rest of people. So definitely, um, and especially as we get older, those sort of age-related problems are going to creep up on all of us. So, um, so I think, you know, those are good questions. and. Um, we have a lot of work to do. So, uh, the great work of this and other National Mass Society chapters and raising money for research really can only continue to uh, advance our understanding of, of how to better help people with MS, and not only their MS, but their overall health. <laughs> So I sit on the committee that uh, nominates people to come give the John O'Connor research lecture. I think uh, did a perfect job because really the goal of this program is to meet an investigator and reflect the people that are in the trenches or um, people that want to do something to make a difference for those with MS. Um, and for you to get beneath the surface and see what it looks like. And maybe not every slide is clear, maybe the graphs don't quite make the sense that you, know, you can't see them very well here or there. But it gives you just an overview of what you were trying to accomplish. And then you actually get to see the research and dig into it a little bit and find out what the controversies and the issues are. And I think she covered all that stuff wonderfully well. Especially how this stuff comes about. So initially, we have epidemiologic studies showing associations, like those military groups. This is these are people that developed MS and then they went and looked back at their blood samples and found that there was an association. We're looking at uh, other people cohorts that had blood samples stored before they got MS. So this is epidemiologic studies. The next level is a retrospective study. So that's sort of like you've got 500 MRIs and you have blood samples. Well, let's look backwards and see what those vitamin D levels tell us about the MRIs that we already collected. And looking for associations there. Um, those establish associations, not causations. And the next level is an intervention. You actually take people and put them on it and see if it does what it is supposed to do. And there's a lot of background that goes into this and a lot of enthusiasm for it. And that's what it takes to go to an intervention level because that's a very costly step. And I think that we heard great caution that this is necessary. I remember just a couple of years ago, vitamin E was really popular. They would, you know, neuroscientists were all taking vitamin E and that's Alzheimer's disease and lots of other things. And it turned out not to be the case. So we need to do that intervention trial to make sure that it's safe and as effective as we think we are because we have associations. We need to establish causations and that interventions actually make a difference. It's a fascinating concept. I mean, is modern living affecting the diseases that we're getting? Is eating highly processed foods, having sedentary lifestyles, being indoors, having jobs where we just sit in front of a computer all day, are these hurting us with certain types of diseases? And it's a very uh, relevant uh, dilemma that we're in. And we also talked about how long it takes for research to get done. And I would say it takes a career to study one drug, <laughs> um, about 20 to 30 years. If you're an investigator, you're probably gonna, if you're going to work on one thing, it's probably going to take you about 20 years to get it to fruition. And it's taking time for writing D, but it's actually moving very quickly. Um, within just a handful of years, the MS Society and other societies have said this is important. People need to know. We need to fund this. 
And this is stuff that pharmaceutical companies aren't going to fund. Um, there's no money in vitamin D, so that's the incentive for people to discover new drugs. This is something that is available already, and this is what national MS societies and governmental agencies need to find. And it's really great that we're getting any answers on this in such quick fashion. And a similar story was with CCSVI, the blockage in the veins. And within a couple of years, we found that this was not true. And there's been about a dozen studies, all done in the last two, three years, in the National Medical Society and the societies, that have shown that this is not the case. So with the MS Society, the answers to these very important questions, which don't have other mechanisms to be answered, are being discovered very quickly. And I think that the vitamin D thing, although it seems to be going slowly, in 2015 we're going to have our answers. I mean, that's really coming up, so this is moving ahead really, really nicely. So, Dr. Mallory's line of research is a perfect example of how money raised by the National Honor Society helps with cutting edge research with promise for progress and potentially a cure. And this vitamin D study that she's running, it's you know, the type of thing that the MSNL campaign wants to address. So, this is a campaign to raise a quarter of a billion dollars by 2016. Uh, we're halfway there uh, since 2011. There's been $131 million raised. And it's really to stop restoring this disease forever. And we have another video that goes over this now campaign. And this is really the big emphasis on what the MSSI is trying to do to gather this momentum that we currently have. Every day, over 20,000 researchers go to work on creating a world free of MS. Every day, we work to understand the disease better and translate new knowledge into treatments that will make a difference in people's lives. Treatments that will make it easier for people to get dressed in the morning. Treatments that will help people regain the ability to walk. Treatments that will ultimately end the disease forever. Every day brings us one step closer, which is why every day matters. There were nights that I'm crying because I couldn't even move my legs to take a shower. My treatment literally was to learn how to walk and get without a cane. I do not think enough is being done with MS research. I think there's more to find out about this illness. I want to be able to live a life where I don't have to plan for my energy levels or when I'm going to be fatigued or can I really bite that lunch on Saturday? I've got a family thing on Sunday. That's my fantasy. My fantasy is that I should be able to just live my life. In closing up, this is sink for me. It's hard for this because, because I can't walk quick enough to be able to get from one side of the street to the other all in one room. It, it takes me too long. The safer thing for me to do is walk half a mile on the street and across walking go that way. And by the time you've got done that, you've added nearly a mile of danger, which makes things even more exhausting. And if I want to be able to go across the road like a normal person, I feel like I'm not a whole person, but it's the realization that part of me doesn't want to put it something to fix that. There is a lot more to be done, and I think things will need to be speaked up. We will need funding for all, all parts of these things, not just for one particular thing to be done, but for a lot of folks to do different things, not just make sense in one single thing. Once it started, you know, peeping in the foot drop and in the lift and having some problem by balance, and that's when things started getting a little rockier. and that's when things started like, ooh, no, here it goes, yeah. It's not the thing, I mean, of course, I don't, you know, it's not all funny games all the time, I have my little days where I just kind of speak loose and you know, ooh, myself, and you know, throw out, and then I snap out of it, and just say, you know, Annie, you just have to face it. It's a cruel disease. It's, you just never know from one day to the next what's going to happen. Like today I'm having a great day, but tomorrow I can wake up and I might be able to get out of my bed. You just never know. Each day is a new struggle. And we found that it worked on something with executive and progressive people too because they're running the boards right now. I love to work again. I really miss working. I love to have a family, which, you know, like right now I don't feel and be able to be a good partner or, you know, family member right now that has so many limitations. That would be uh, a dream.
We have to pursue all promising paths, and we must do it faster. We can stop the disease in its tracks. We can restore what's been lost, and ultimately, we will end this disease. It's our responsibility. It's what people with the eyes need and expect. It's why we get up each day. The answers are there, and our commitment to people with MS isn't just to get it done, but to do it now. Your support has the power to stop the disease. Your support has the power to restore what I've lost. Your support has the power to end the disease. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a safe trip home.